This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 280, recorded on April 11th, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me right here in the TWIV studio, Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent. I'm seeing too much of you, Dixon. <laughs> well, our wives are beginning to suspect, but that's okay. <laughs> you need to make sure you stay proximal to the microphone. I'm attempting my best. Otherwise, I'm going to take it away from you. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm right All here. All right, good I'm to have you. It. Good to be here. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. How have you been? I'm okay, and the weather is great. Nice, huh? Yeah. 62 degrees and sunny. Nice. What is it here, yeah. Dixon? Let's see. It is you know, in the I 60s. Drove, I was driving on the turnpike today, Yep. and just before the Vince Lombardi rest ah, stop, yes. Yes, yes. there was a pile of snow on the side of the road. <laughs> Still, it's 22 degrees. It's over 68. That's right. It's like about 70, right? It's amazing. Wow. The daffodils are out. Daffodils are out there. White caps on the Hudson today? I didn't look. Uh, no, not today. Yesterday also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Welcome Richard. back. Well, it's great to be back. Like you say, Good. welcome back, Condit. It would be like, welcome there back, Carter, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. Neat. We missed you. Oh, well, I missed you That's guys, too. spoken Thank from you. the depths of our viruses. Wow. <laughs> That's really something. <laughs> By the way, it is 80 degrees Fahrenheit here, right. 26.7 Celsius. Puffy blue clouds, this is about <laughs> as good as it gets. And I mean, puffy the, white clouds in a blue sky. The second right. day of the Masters. Uh, mm-hmm. That, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. I guess you have nice weather, right? Yeah, yeah. It's getting a little overcast. It's 64 Fahrenheit, 18 Celsius, and uh, and the overcast is rolling in, and it's um, (laughs) supposed to supposed to rain a little bit. But um, did you put away your snow wool? My oh my uh, my wobble. wobble. wobble yeah. is, it's not a snow wobble. 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 It, yeah. It's a snow wool for a wuffle. I think they've changed the brand a couple of times. I got, I got an email which is not here today, but a guy sent a picture of his version of. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's from Europe somewhere. Uh, I should get it in one of the future episodes. So has yeah. Mount Snowplow melted for you, Ellen? Uh, the one at the end of my driveway has the one at the grocery store. Uh, last time I drove oh. past it, it was still still a couple of feet high. How about that? Because oh, they take their whole parking lot and pile it up in one yeah, sure. big there's, mountain. There's a parking deck here where they plow it off the top, and it's now on the north side. <laughs> completely shaded. So I'm predicting it'll be mid-May or maybe June. <laughs> Got to be global warming here, guys. <laughs> It's going to be there a long time. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. All right, today we have, for your listening pleasure, all email in an attempt to catch up. and we do, Which we will never do. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we do. We do a few. We do a concerted effort. and we do, Yeah, that's true. But uh, not today. But that's fine. Then we, we ought to do this at 2x speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, they could play it back at 2x. It's like, yeah, but that's not going to get through any more emails. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's true. We have a couple of follow-ups. First, uh, Paul Dupre wrote us, as you may have heard, the Boston City Council is going to entertain an ordinance to ban BSL-4 research in the city of Boston. I can't tell you how devastating such a ban would be, especially after going through the supplemental risk assessment process, having it blessed by two independent scientific groups, the NRC and the Blue Ribbon Panel, and having prevailed in federal court, and we expect soon the state court. We need as many supporters as possible to come to the hearing April 16th at 4 p.m. in the city council. Wow. Please make every effort to attend. If you'd like to say a few words, please let me know. And, and this uh, is this is in regard to the um, uh, the needle, mm-hmm. yes, the BSL four lab that we toured. toured. That's right. And yes. uh, this is actually a letter he forwarded from Ron Corley, um, and um, ASM sent out. So I asked ASM to do something. So they made a statement, which we will put uh, in the show notes, which is basically saying 
the same thing. Uh, there's the, the hearing on April 16th. There are links to the ordinance and the public hearing and the schedule of the Boston City Council, which we'll put there so you can see that. Mm. They also say that ASM filed an amicus brief with the Supreme Court of Massachusetts on a case involving a BSL-4 laboratory, affirming the importance and safety of BSL-4 laboratories. That same year, the Society also provided similar testimony before the U.S. House of Representatives. So, you know, we had a wonderful documentary there. We saw how incredibly safe this is. So I, I think the Boston City Council needs to watch Threading the Needle. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I can kind of see where, you know, some of the, I, I think maybe the public relations on this wasn't quite handled as well as it could have been early on. And I'm not sure that you can fix that after the fact, but I guess we'll see. But don't you think if they watched Threading the Needle, they would not... Uh, well, I, um, I mean, it's so secure. I was just so impressed. I was very impressed with the security, and I'm, I'm not at all concerned about danger from this thing. Um, I, I think uh, my own feeling is that it's not it's not so much an anti BSL four thing as an anti BU thing. Really, really. Um, oh. I bear in mind BU has some history with this. They had right. Uh, they blew they, it once before. They right? blew it with tularemia several years ago and failed to report it and really, really screwed up. Oh dear. Um, and uh, you know they had they had some exposures in a lab and some people got it and it was supposed to be contained and they turned out they didn't report it in a timely manner and all oh, sorts dear. of stuff. And um, now. Frankly, I think that actually when an institution has had some kind of a gaffe like that, they're probably safer than they used to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, oh, wow, that some big failure just happened. Except it's, for well, the General Motors Corporation, of course. Except for maybe General Motors. <laughs> Although, you know, maybe next year they'll mm, be the safest cars. Maybe. But, um, but you know, that, that did happen. And people there remember that happening. And then to sure. turn around and... Sure. Um, and approach this this BSL four facility in a way that I, just looking through the advocacy on this, I, I think there was um, th- there was some feeling from the community that they were that they were not adequately informed early enough in the process, and it was just kind of you know they're breaking ground on it, and now it's done, and and now the objections are really as entrenched as the building, and and mm-hmm. yeah, it's a good point, and that's, and that's where we- it's coming from. As we will see in this episode, sometimes when you try and convince people yeah. that things are okay, it backfires. <laughs> it yes, backfires. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah, so it's not, I, I mean, my own feeling is that this thing should be fine, but um, if the, you know, if they'd handled the PR better earlier on, then maybe we wouldn't be at this point. Because you look at other, bi- at other BSL-4 facilities around the country, they haven't had these problems. Mm, but they're not in Boston, right? They're not in Boston, but Boston is a, you know, it's a progressive city with a no, lot no. of research going Alan, on. Alan, remember it's, uh, what happened when the first genes were isolated? Right. Yes. Boston they had a huge was problem with that. Right. Very on top of that, and the researchers got out ahead of it and right. managed to allow the research to occur in Boston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in this case, we're not talking about a branch of research that just happened one day in a lab. We're talking oh, about a not. building that was years in the planning and then was constructed. And, um, you know, the time to sort out the community opposition was before breaking ground. But we passed that point, and now we've got 200 and some odd million dollars worth of scarce NIH funds sunk in this thing, and I'd really hate to see that flushed. Yeah, in this case, yeah. logic does not dictate that. <laughs> right. You can't fill in that missing sentence. Well, if we have listeners in the area and you're so interested or so inclined, go over to the meeting. Right. And make a case. Yep. Yeah, uh, I think having people show up at that meeting would be good. Yeah. I have a response here from Saul Silverstein, my colleague. I sent him last week a paper that a listener sent in on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. The paper suggested an association with herpes virus cimiri. And uh, he writes, he uses antibodies to human proteins to imply that HVS counterparts are expressed in these lesions while conserved because of function. This is not trustworthy. Similarly, he makes quantitative measurements based on in situ hybridization intensities, not too hot. The only compelling data are those associated with PCR amplification and sequence analysis of the Cimiri DNA polymerase amplicon in figure four. However, we are not shown these results. Oops. So he didn't like the paper. Yep, Saul doesn't sound like he's convinced. No. Nope. Yeah, so that's uh, okay. And then we have one from 
Conrad, Dear Twiv Twim Team. In episode 279, you discussed the publication of negative results. We really need a better term for this, mm. as well as the infrastructure that would be required and how to finance this. Don't worry about that. That is more or less solved and can, should not only be applied to negative results, but to all research data. For example, Figshare or Zenodo, and he gives links, are services designed to host scientific data and are basically free of charge. Although Figshare has some premium features like increased private storage and larger file sizes. At those platforms, you can even get a DOI for each item. You can even upload manuscripts that are not going to be submitted to a peer-reviewed journal to one of these platforms or send those manuscripts to preprint services like Archive BioArchive. While you can host in principle anything on Figshare or Zenodo, other publicly funded repositories are more appropriate for certain data types. For example, short read sequencing data can be stored in the Sequence Read Archive or the European Nucleotide Archive. Those require, beside the actual data, also metadata, which improve the ability to search and find items. I'm aware that all these are just technical solutions. Besides those, the different scientific communities have to develop a consensus where and how to host the data. This will be very important to increase the findability of such data. And so we had, I think, remarked that maybe the tech wasn't up to storing all this, but apparently it is. Hmm. Besides this comment, I would like to thank all of you for your educative and entertaining podcast series, which I have followed since many years. Unfortunately, I'm commuting a lot, which or luckily... Or slash, yeah, I get it. Luckily, slash, unfortunately, I know that. <laughs> I've been commuting a lot, which gives me time to listen to your and other podcasts. As a bioinformatician who is working in the field of infection biology and systems biology medicine, I highly appreciate the scientific input of your show. Hmm. Additionally, if you allow, I would like to place some self advertisement by pointing you and the German speaking part of your audience to a related podcast. It's called Open Science Radio. All right. Started by Matthias Fromm, and I joined it at the beginning of this year. We discuss bi-weekly, well, we try to, different topics related <laughs> to open science. The podcast is in German, but we might have some interviews with English-speaking scientists in the near future. Keep on the great work. Best wishes, Conrad. P.S. Temperature in Würzburg, Germany, is currently <laughs> 9.1 degrees Celsius, 282.25 Kelvin. Air pressure is at 1019 HPAs, and it's cloudy. The wind coming from the northeast has a velocity of 3.6 kilometers per hour. I've been to Würzburg. Wonderful town. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. nice. Well, I that's like cool. This, I like this email because he has written it like a paper with citations in the text, and now all the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the, li the links the are, all, are all numbered footnotes. The links? Yeah. You mean nice. to the left? <laughs> yeah, very nice. Thank you, Conrad. All right. Now let's get into... Our email. Oh, uh, Kathy, would you start? Sure. Greg writes, Hi, your special TWIV episode with Ian Lipkin and Thomas Breeze on MERS coronavirus in dromedary camels reminded me of one of my favorite Frank Zappa songs, <laughs> an instrumental at the end of the 1969 Hot Rats album called It Must Be a Camel. <laughs> Speaking of Frank Zappa, a press release went around recently about a microbe that has supposedly made the leap from a human opportunistic pathogen to an obligate endophyte. Two of the authors were quoted as saying, This bacteria is so unconventional in its behavior and its new habitat is so unexpected that we thought of Frank Zappa. <laughs> <laughs> so my question for Twim is this. Um, is there evidence for this amazing transformation convincing? So uh, I, it looks like you're going to discuss this on TWIM in yeah, the future. I think, I think yeah. we will do that. It's a, it's a bacterium that went from humans, it's an acne-causing bacterium, Propionibacterium acnes, to grapevines. Oh. Yeah, go figure Great that one. Friends. They actually have pretty good evidence, which is a little more controlled than the, um, what was it, a plant-to-bee story that we talked about with uh -huh. the virus. Mm -hmm. Well, if it went to grapevines, it's more Martin Gay than uh, Frank Zappa, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did hear it on the... No, I saw it on the grapevine. <laughs> Any, but do you guys like Frank Zappa? Yeah. I listen, listen to him a little bit in college. College, not anymore. He wasn't no. a weird person. I think I didn't know there was... It must be a camel. Uh, Ian Lipkin should be <laughs> using that. <laughs> I, uh, I, I listened to it a little bit. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. They've even named this bug P. Zappe. That's great. That's pretty funny. That is funny. Okay. Um, 
Alan, could you do the next one, please? Sure. John writes, Dear Twivmeisters, on episode 274, you advocated safe sex or no sex in reference to avoiding HPV infection. It is important to note that condoms, even if correctly used, do not eliminate the risk of HPV infection since it's transmissible from vaginal fluids to parts of the skin not covered by condoms. I would provide more definitive references, but they seem to be mostly stuck behind a paywall, the great knowledge-censoring condom of our time. (laughs) I'm sure Alan will infer what human organ most resembles the for-profit journal system. Hmm. Incidentally, HPV causes cancer in males as well as females, most notably head and neck cancer. Uh, Oh, for uh, for more FU, a few episodes back, there were some remarks made about injecting herpes virus into humans. This is exactly what Amgen has done with its TVEC oncolytic cancer virus, which appears to be well on its way to to approval in melanoma given its most recent interim phase 3 data release. Mm. It's important to note, however, that Amgen has made a genetic deletion which eliminates the neurotropism of their virus. P.S. Dixon and the anti-abstinence crowd might find it amusing that my uncle, who practiced family medicine, once testified in front of the Texas state legislature that Just Say No had done about as much to prevent teenage pregnancy and illegal drug use as Have a Nice Day did for depression. (laughs) (laughs) It's for you, Dixon. That's good. I got, I got it. I yep. got it. I got yeah, it. Yeah, he's right. This is absolutely all correct, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, um, yeah, these oncolytic viruses are really moving along. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, neat stuff. Rich, uh, the next one is for you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> this is from our friend Martin. Indeed. Dear Twiv, I am honored that you have chosen me to be the denialist kook to periodically beat up on. Here is something a little more substantial for you to chew on and spit out. Can I just interject for a moment? Sure. Mm. Instead of reading the rest of this, you could briefly summarize it, because I'm certain that Martin is just trolling us at this point. You think? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah, okay. this is this is not productive. He's just throwing stuff out there because here, here. he got a response and he wants another response. So here's your right. response, Martin. Uh, his uh, he quotes two different HIV denialist uh, camps: the Duisburg camp that says that the virus exists but doesn't cause HIV, and what's called the Perth camp that denies even that the virus exists and asks us who is right. Uh, and has some other uh, issues with it. And the answer is that both are about as wrong as wrong can be. Wrong, 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 wrong. End of story. It's a waste of time to even think about it. And we've discussed these issues on TWIV in the past, so he can just go back to the archives. Right. Okay. Uh, Dixon. Right. I'll do the short one. Francois writes, Hello from France. Or should I do it in a French accent? No, no, no. no, please no, no, no. Small presentation. I have missed a scientist career 10 years ago to find a job and find some use for my microbiology training and work on raw milk cheese microbiota. Uh, way cooler term than microflora, by the way. If you can find some in the U.S., try it when coming back from Teresa prone country. Empirically, it makes miracles. Of course, in the U.S., it may be classified as a massive destructive weapon. (laughs) If you're not already speaking of it, here's an article about effective messages in vaccine promotion. Pre-article, and it lists another article. To make it short, ask parents with reservations about vaccines if they will vaccinate their children against MMR vaccination 70% chance. Then explain to them that the link between MMR vaccine and autism was bogus, and the chance drops to 45%. With this kind of reaction in some of the most developed countries, country, humanity will go dodo in no time. That is an astonishing level of stupid. Francois. Yeah, I saw this study when it came out. Yeah. yeah. By the way, the best way to get parents to comply with vaccination regimens for their young children by pediatricians, I heard it on an NPR story just very recently, was to refuse to be their pediatrician if they didn't yeah. do it. Yeah, right. And most of them capitulated. Also, the, the there have been some surveys about messages that work and messages that don't. And one of the ones that works best is to um, to lead by example. Yep. Um, and so, uh, you know, in talking with other parents, because I've got a child in elementary school, and every now and then vaccines have come up as a subject. And right. 
one of the things that I introduce early in the conversation is Sophie gets hers. That's I right. get mine. That's right. That's <laughs> Which, right. So That's right. that that definitely helps too. But it, yes, this was a, yeah. a depressing, but I guess maybe it shouldn't be too surprising. Right, right. Kind of result that people don't like to be told what to do. Of course not. Bonjour, François. Merci beaucoup. Oui. Um, we have another uh, email later on the same issue. Mm-hmm. Hope maybe we'll get to it. All right, the next one's from Yang. Dear editor. It's <laughs> 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 great. We're all editors. Yeah, right. I'm a Chinese student majoring in veterinary. Last day, I read a paper which talking about monoclonal antibodies. I found a question in the process of these monoclonals. The paper, which is about broad cross protection against H5N1 uh, avian influenza infection by means of monoclonal antibodies is as follows. He says five strains were chosen. Uh, They prepared monoclonals by standard hypodoma technology. Um, And then uh, they did diffusion. They got a panel of 52 broadly cross-reactive H5-specific monoclonals, which were generated and characterized. The question is, why is this measure can produce so many different kinds of antibodies? Mm Mm-hmm. Do these viruses recombine? And if so, why can they after having been inactivated? Thank you for your patience. Well, uh, Young, when you I- immunize mice with an antigen, a complex antigen, uh, you get monoclonals of many different specificities because the antigens are processed and presented to uh, B cells bearing antibodies and It's just a normal way of of doing it. You get lots and lots of specificities, and each monoclonal cell line or clone is making a specific antibody to a specific epitope. So there can be hundreds and hundreds that just interact with the antigen, and some of those will neutralize. Yeah, and when you're making making monoclonals as opposed to a polyclonal, um, the definition of that is that you're actually isolating all the individual or a bunch of the individual clones of antibodies. So each of these is reacting to a different part of H5, but that's just a normal part of the immune response. So what interested me about this uh, is that in order to get broadly cross-reactive antibodies, they did a series of immunizations with different strains Right. Uh, the, for which they were looking cross reactivity, and I guess the effect of that, uh, if you uh, immunize with one strain and then boost with another strain, what's going to happen is that you will, uh, I guess, more or less selectively boost uh, the uh, antibodies that are uh, that hit epitopes that are common between the two strains that are cross reacting. So if you do that with a series of five, you wind up out uh, selecting out an immune response uh, or mm, getting a, a, a greater immune response for cross-reacting uh, antibodies. Then you go make the monoclonals and those pop out. I thought that was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Now, these are, of course, broadly reactive against H5 strains. That's right. What, that's what they looked at here in this. All right, we're back to Kathy. Okay, Randy writes, Hello, TWIV hosts. The current conditions in Phoenix, 16 Celsius, 33% humidity, winds southeast at 4 miles per hour, barometer 29.95 mercury. Last year, my wife and I found a stray dog that appeared to be ill. We took him to the vet who diagnosed him with canine distemper. Over the course of the next several days and weeks, it progressed to the neurologic state. He had several seizures over a one-week period. After the seizures ceased, he began making a very slow but progressive recovery. In the months since, his myoclonus and ataxia have improved from severe to slight. Aside from his inability to jump, there are almost no outward appearances of any physical deficiency. He eats, drinks, sleeps, and plays like any healthy dog. Here's where the story gets interesting. Nasal, ocular, blood, and fecal tests are negative, but bimonthly are negative, comma, but bimonthly urine-based RT-PCR tests have been positive for several months. The CT bounces between 34 and 35, but most recently has been in the 35s. We've consulted numerous vets, but can't seem to get consensus on several issues. This led me into the world of virology. Mm -hmm. I must say I'm fascinated beyond words. Had I known this world existed, I would have become a virologist instead of going into finance. I'm (laughs) studying Virology 101 as well as Columbia University's Virology W3310 on iTunes U. Here are my unanswered questions in no particular order. What are the possible outcomes of an animal infected with this virus? Certainly death is one, viral clearance is another. What about carrier status? 
uh, parentheses, persistent infection. Does a very low viral load imply carrier status or simply shedding? I'm told dogs can shed for a year. Speaking of shedding, does the term mean infective virus or harmless viral particles that have been dispatched by the immune system? We've been told the virus can hide in the CNS or other cells and come back months or even years after tests show he's negative. Is this true? If so, won't antibodies make this a non-event or will the virus have mutated to a point where the adaptive immune system will no longer recognize it, which we're told is a possibility. Wow. I think I'll stop there because that's a lot of questions mm, in one indeed. for number one. Indeed. So canine distemper is a morbilly virus, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a negative sense RNA uh, membrane. The closest familiar relative is measles in humans. Right. That's right. Our friend Paul Dupre works on it. Yeah. Right. And uh, I don't know I don't know the answers to a lot of his questions. Got, yeah, so he's got some answers below which uh let's see if they're if they're in the same order. Cross species in fact I don't think he asked these. Why don't we a- answer it with polls later? There are a couple of things I wanted to answer though. Um shedding means it can be a mix of infectious and non-infectious virus, but usually shedding means infectivity. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. Hiding in the CNS. I think Paul addresses that uh later on, but um, let's. Why don't you do them all, and we'll get to Paul's okay. response. Yeah. Since the virus is still active, albeit at a very low viral load, cell damage is occurring. How does the rate of this cell damage compare to natural cell death? The reason I ask is because I'm concerned about long-term damage and/or the body's inability to cope with this rate of damage. Three interferons are truly amazing. Currently, he's on alpha beta. I've read great things about feline recombinant interferon omega. My concern about human alpha beta is the likelihood he has uh, that he has an immunity to interferon. The vet prescribed giving them five days a week versus seven days a week to prevent immunity, but this doesn't sound correct to me. <laughs> Does reduced frequency of exposure really prevent or minimize immunity? If he has developed an immunity, what alternatives to interferon exist? There appear to be quite a few immune system boosters on the market, but many seem pseudoscientific and some really look like snake oil. <laughs> <laughs> What's your opinion of anything which claims to boost the immune system? So he's certainly going to make antibodies to human uh, human or feline interfere on whatever he's getting. Sure. Right. right? And to, going to five versus seven has zero effect on <laughs> developing those antibodies. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's uh, – well, the vet, the vet is accustomed to prescribing – drugs and with a drug if there's a problem cutting yeah, back on yeah. the number of days you're getting it taking a break could make right. a difference but with the antibody production that's not going to no. affect it i think these immune boosters are all snake oil anything that yeah. that claims <laughs> to boost the immune system that is not an fda or or veterinary evaluated claim it's just yeah we don't sell snake oil anymore. Maybe <laughs> somebody should. <laughs> right. uh, I must say, Randy has uh, great questions and great intuition. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, four, is every infected cell considered an inclusion body? I see references to infected cells and also inclusion bodies, but I don't understand the difference, if any. Is there a difference? Do cytotoxic T cells target inclusion bodies? So inclusion bodies are referring to things that you see inside of cells and inclusion bodies can be virus factories so they can be sets of virion particles uh in various states of assembly they can i think uh they can even be ribosomes can't they in some uh, Mm -hmm. rabies Um, so they can be all different kinds of things so an infected cell is definitely different from an inclusion body uh, the question, is there a difference? Do cytotoxic T cells target inclusion bodies? <laughs> uh, I don't think they would specifically target inclusion bodies unless the part of the inclusion body antigenic material were presented on the cell surface. Yeah, T cells see processed right. proteins that are presented on the cell surface, so they're not looking at what's inside the cell, but what arises from within inside the cell. So the connection is a little tenuous. Mm-hmm. Right. Five, once cleared from the body, if indeed this is a possible outcome, is there cause for concern over future virus-related complications? Wikipedia states, life-threatening signs usually include those due to the degeneration of the nervous system. 
dogs that have been infected with distemper tend to suffer a progressive deterioration of mental abilities and motor skills. With time, the dog can acquire more severe seizures, paralysis, reduction in sight, and in coordination. These dogs are usually humanely euthanized due to the immense pain and suffering they face. End quote from Wikipedia. This seems counterintuitive. How can a virus that's no longer present cause progressive deterioration mm. and impede the body's natural ability to heal itself? Mm. Okay, so that's the end of the questions, I think. Uh, so, yeah, what Paul said, this is an impressive question. Some of these questions he asked are the, kind, are the stud of a virologist's career. Others, we just don't have the models or data to know. In general, there's a lot in this. An episode in itself... Basically, this dog hit it lucky. There are not too many on alpha, beta, interferon. However, most likely it will die as the virus presumably is in its brain. The assumption that the virus is active cannot be made. These are RT-PCR data, no virus isolations. And some highlights. Cross-species infections are prevalent. The virus was most likely picked up following interaction with local wildlife, raccoons being a strong possibility. More billy viruses are very infectious. Compare this to the measles virus outbreak in New York. We understand a lot about the acute disease. We know it infects immune, epithelial, and CNS cells. And he sent a paper of his on this. It's difficult from the male to know when the primary infection was, but we could assume the virus is probably out of the immune system. The virus could possibly be infecting epithelial cells. I don't think this is likely. The virus is very likely in the CNS under the immune surveillance radar. The CDV vaccine is very efficacious. The stray would not have been vaccinated, so just like the people in New York, it's a prime target for CDV. It's well documented that in some instances there are neurological sequelae in dogs that recover acute infections. This can happen months later. Think SSPE in the case of measles. We have had a number of isolates in the lab from unvaccinated dogs. This is actually quite a common occurrence as the virus is very prevalent across all of North America. So he sent a couple of papers which we'll post and he said they're very readable, and cross-species infection is really very current. This is what DARPA are supporting us for. It's a great way to safely understand how viruses jump. The species barrier out of all the morbidly viruses, CDV is the master at this. Hmm. I think we should have Paul on to do an episode on CDV. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It sounds really interesting. And he's Plus, got he's got a great accent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the uh, uh, one of the questions that... Um, is it Randy asked? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, was it didn't make any sense to him that there would be neurological sequelae after the virus is cleared? And if I understood Paul correctly, he's equating those neurological, those downstream neurological effects to something like SSPE, which is subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is the persistence in nervous tissue of basically a defective uh, virus particle that I don't think anybody fully understands how it works, but it causes uh, neurological degeneration down the road. So it's basically an altered uh, form of the virus that persists in nervous tissue and can cause downstream effects. Right. You don't see infectivity, but you do have this this effect, right? And there's there's no evidence for autoimmunity after? Well, that's what I was wondering. Paul doesn't mention anything, but that's what I was wondering as a as a possibility. But sure. Paul is giving a different explanation. Mm-hmm. And Paul evidently sent something to a vet who replied that the do- dog will not clear the virus and said that he thinks it's crazy that the vet is sending out bimonthly RT-PCR. The only benefit that he can see is the money for the vet and the company doing the testing. Yeah. There's no data, to my knowledge, about shedding patterns in chronically infecting dogs. Infected dogs, yeah. So, uh, should I read the last part? Okay, so the last part, uh, I love the casual conversation format of the podcast. If it were a lecture, it wouldn't be nearly as enjoyable. May I suggest the addition of a story arc? Many TV shows have Mm. a story that spans several episodes or even a season or more. I I think we have a lot of story arcs. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, we just did one earlier. (laughs) (laughs) This is referred to as an arc. The arc is generally not the focus of any episode. In fact, sometimes only a very small amount of time per episode is used to advance the story. Isn't the life cycle of a virus a story? In the case of a typical CDV infection, the story begins with the initial infection in the respiratory system, then viremia, then sometimes neurological things, then death or clearance. I think it would be very interesting and informative to listeners to take a given virus and describe its life cycle, how it moves from one stage to another, 
and how much of an impact its life may or may not have on the host. What I mean by impact is how some infected dogs are asymptomatic, subclinical, and others succumb to the virus in less than a week. Right. Thanks for a great podcast. All right, so we'll just end it there and make an arc, right? <laughs> That's right. I think, I think our story arc is the weather. <laughs> oh, and our virus is alive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you don't think it's bad enough. Viruses you're... can make you sick. There <laughs> are um, arcs, yeah. If the... And uh, vaccines. Uh, yeah. XMRV. You know. Yeah, we get we get major yeah major stories that cycle through a uh, bird H5N1, flu. Five N one, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Alan, it's your turn. Okay. Oh, I got a nice short one. Oh, a pair of short ones. All right. Sure. Th- these are both from the same Stephen, right? Apparently, yeah. Okay. Stephen writes, funny coincidence that I was listening to Twiv 274 on my work commute today, and later in the day, I ran across this related slash dot post, and um, sends a link to. Um, uh, to essentially a summary of exactly the study we just discussed, mm-hmm. um, that if you tell people that the uh, um, that the Wakefield paper was debunked, then they become less likely to vaccinate. Um, and then Stephen writes, uh, I wouldn't be so crass as to mention a few writing errors, such as uninfected amoebae or giant viruses, which typically infect amoebae, instead of are cultured in amoebae. I did like the Chantal Abergel and Jean-Michel Claverie, a wife and husband team, and sends a link to a New York Times article. Um, And this is about uh, the giant virus uh, story arc, which uh, we've discussed a few times on here. Uh, This is a summary by Carl Zimmer. uh, Of course, we have discussed this uh, paper on TWIV before. Yeah. Right. This this one was... uh, the one actually, you did sorry. with uh, Eugene Cooney. The Kuhn, pethovirus, right? yeah. I don't think we actually yeah, did. We, we didn't. do this paper. No, we, I, I didn't. We kind of uh, we kind of bounced off it with uh, with, with Eugene. Eugene. I actually did it on TWIM because I knew I wouldn't get to it on TWIM for a couple of weeks because of mm-hmm. special episodes. So there is a discussion on TWIM, right? Right. It all fuses together. Indeed. Rich, you're next. Mark writes. Hello, Team Twiv. It's Mark F. in San Jose, California again. We're in the midst of a Pacific storm bringing needed rain. Build an arc. Weekly <laughs> listening to Twiv has made me aware of how large weather fronts occasionally cross the continent. This is great. Changing character as they move. Last week's California rain became your snow. Indeed. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I am... Transplanted from the East Coast, I was an undergraduate at MIT and believe my tenure overlapped with Vincent's when he postdoced, to create a verb, in David Baltimore's lab. Question to Vincent, were you in uh, Cambridge for the blizzard in January 1979 when the Charles River froze? Vincent? No, I wasn't there yet. No, I went in the fall. I walked across the Charles River from Cambridge to Boston near the Harvard yeah. Bridge a few times. I wow. about that, yeah. On serious stuff, in an economics blog I read, the author quoted an L.A. Times story of Claveret's recent discovery, reported in PNAS this week, of another giant virus discovery. The article, in my opinion, is alarmist and seems to me written as <laughs> link bait. <laughs> uh, and he links the article, and it's a as he says, an L.A. Times story about the pithovirus. Uh, I have two requests of the Twivome. One, discuss Clavery's new paper. 30, the title is 30,000-year-old distant relative of giant icosahedral DNA viruses with a Pandora virus morphology that is hidden behind a paywall at, and he gives the PNAS link, and two, post the L.A. Times article as a listener pick of the week, but with a twist. TWIV listeners should read and dissect it paragraph by paragraph, noting the subtle intermixing of relevant and irrelevant facts to stir things up. (laughs) One example, describing HIV's physical size and implying that Clavery's new discovery could be more lethal to humans because it is physically larger. He makes a parallel argument in terms of the number of base pairs in each virus. There are many other Mm -hmm. constructions to discover. All the best. So, <laughs> yeah, Rich, that, you remember uh, Kunin said to us that he'd been talking to the press and they were asking him all the wrong questions yeah. <laughs> about the virus? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, a big sort of uh, attempt, I 
don't think even in the original article it was, in my opinion, misguided uh, to as part of the sell for this is the notion that they could cover recover live virus out of uh, you know thirty thousand year old permafrost stuff and what were the implications for this for uh, you know infecting the population with ancient viruses that we're not familiar with etc. Um, Actually, I put a link in here to a uh, paper in EID, in, uh, Emerging Infectious Diseases, that I find very interesting. That's a study uh, that uh, looks at old pox virus specimens uh, and reviews the literature on that. And there have been investigations of corpses in the permafrost and scabs that show up in archival material of one sort or another as to whether or not they contain pox virus DNA, whether or not they contain infectious material. And basically the bottom line is, yeah, you can find virus here and there, but there's never been any uh, transmission of consequence. It's something that maybe is worth being aware of, but not worth flipping out about. Mm. All right. Well, that's an interesting um, exercise. If anyone wants to take it on, let us know what you think about that article. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Dixon, you are next. Okie doke. Jenny writes, Greetings to everyone at TWIV. On episode 274, you asked if there were any listeners left from the XMRV days. Hi. <laughs> I discovered the show during the early days of XMRV, back to, back to episode 76, and I have been a weekly listener ever since. I guess I'm just n equals one, but I enjoy the, but I continue to enjoy the podcast every week, and you have helped me become a better science consumer. That's great. Please bring on Dr. Silverman to talk about his paper tracking down how XMRV finding went wrong. He showed great integrity in conducting through such a long. Through a thorough Such check. A thorough. I'm going to try this again, okay? <laughs> he showed great integrity in conducting such a thorough check on his own work, and I am very glad it was published because it's important to have a full and accurate record of what happened. It is all too easy for the story to be revised in the telling. I've written one about one such example of this from a 2013 here and here. There's a links to those two. While the role of XMRV and ME slash CFS has been settled, the ramifications and impacts on the issue continue. The story is still being written, both in a forthcoming book by Dr. Mikovitz and in the political controversies of research funding and creation of a new case definition. The ME slash CSF, CFS, sorry, CFS landscape is still experiencing the aftershocks of the XMRV controversy. Thanks for all you do with the show, including presenting science in a way that this former lawyer can understand. Cheers, Jenny. I met Jenny at a CFS meeting a number of years ago. Cool. TWIV fan. Thank you, Jenny. I'd love to have uh, Silverman on for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It'd be good. Because that was a good story. Yeah. So we'll, we'll the uh, uh, Mikovitz book makes me a little ill. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate. But, you know, you, you get to tell your it's story country, here in the U.S. It's a free country. It's, and yeah. uh, right. people can buy it or not. The subtitle of that, I looked it up. Uh, um, let me see if I can find it. Well, it uses the adjective intrepid. Mm -hmm. Yes. One scientist's intrepid search for the truth oh, come about on. human yeah. retroviruses and chronic fatigue syndrome, <laughs> autism, and other diseases. That's right on the cover. It's, it's yeah. actually misspelled. It's inept. The word is inept. <laughs> well, you know, people can be fooled, but she was so insistent that she was right and didn't do the proper controls. But actually, it was apparently duplicitous from the start. So sure. this is not an intrepid search for the truth. No. I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. We've gone over this. Uh, right. The next one's from Keith. That was that was an arc. Yes, that was <laughs> quite an arc. An the arc sails on. <laughs> I think it's still arcing. <laughs> yeah. Keith writes, "Dear Twivologicians." Oh my! Oh, God. That's a new one. Twivologians. In the discussion on Twiv two seven four, the question arose of how long RNA might be capable of surviving in aged samples. You might find of interest the link below for a study suggesting the recovery of seven hundred and fifty year old RNA. Hmm. The described RT-PCR products were 123 to 137 nucleotides in length. The bulk of the biochemical work consisted of an analysis of 
sRNA with an average length of 20 nucleotides. The conclusion of the authors was, quote, this evidence leads us to conclude that we have de detected a genuine instance of barley stripe mosaic virus from a 750-year-old archaeological sample of barley, which is the oldest authenticated instance of an ancient virus and the first archaeological virus genome that has been sequenced. The name of the paper is A Complete Ancient RNA Genome Identification, Reconstruction, and Evolutionary History of Archaeological Barley Stripe Mosaic Virus. Mm. That's cool. Keith mm. is a yeah. professor mm. at Cornell University Plant Pathology, Dixon. Absol absolutely. I bet it's in the ag school, right? Sounds that way. So this is quite interesting. 750 years. It's, uh, I'm surprised because RNA, well, they got pieces, right? And they put it all together. Right. Yeah, it was so, barley there. Ooh. Oh, but there was a great a, title. But there was a grain of truth in their findings. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, uh, <laughs> the 1918 flu yes. uh, was recovered from a combination of formal and fixed samples. Mm -hmm. And wasn't that also some corpses yep. uh, from frozen. the frost? Yep, That's frozen right. up in Siberia. Now, right. that was probably only, uh, well, 1918. That's yeah. only a, but I don't know. That part of me thinks. Any... Part of me thinks if you could make it a hundred years, you could make it seven hundred years. But I guess <laughs> that's a bit of an extrapolation. That doesn't work for people. Methuselah <laughs> believed that, I'm sure. But I often wonder when they dig up these mammoths that are all frozen that they ate meat from them once. Some explorers actually dined on a woolly mammoth, and those are forty thousand years old. There's got to be all kinds of stuff in there. I yeah. think so. I would think so. So the flu was pulled from corpses that were frozen in a tundra in Alaska, I think. Has anyone ever looked in a mammoth to see whether or not they had viruses? I don't know. It's not been published, so it's probably negative results. Dixon. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> or the Iceman that was found up in... Uh, would they find giant viruses? In a right. Mammoth? I right. think it's a good, no, it would be a worthwhile ones. thing. If you, so the mammoth genome was sequenced, right? Right. So you could look right. for endogenous retroviruses. Yes, you could. Sure. yes you could. I'm sure they're there. They were all locked away in a trunk. Okay, we're back to Kathy. Erica writes, Hello, TWIV team. I just stumbled on TWIV this past week, and I have fallen in love with the podcasts. <laughs> I've been listening to them while I do bench work in my labs. I'm currently an undergraduate in microbiology at the University of Florida, <laughs> but my heart lies in virology. My main reason for emailing was to thank you all for such informative and entertaining podcasts. I've learned so much through TWIV and TWIM this past week. Rich, in TWIV 265, you mentioned my PI, Dr. Stephanie Karst, and her work. I thought it was so awesome to hear such great praise about my PI in the podcast. We just recently put out a publication, my first, and I wanted to share it. And she links to an MBio paper from Stephanie's lab about uh, findings that malnourished mice developed more severe neurovirus infections and failed to mount effective memory immunity to a secondary challenge. So interesting work. And did, did you see who the editor was? On that? <laughs> oh, Vincent Racaniello. <laughs> ah, did not notice that. <laughs> what I was confused by is that there's an Erica in the author list, but the Erica is spelled differently than this Erica, so mm. I can't quite figure that out. But, okay. Um, they also uh, have evidence that noroviruses evolve more readily in the face of malnutrition. Hmm. So I might have written that finding. without the K, because I usually type the names, you know. Ah. Okay. She said it's her first paper, it's, so that must be C our... Uh, C-K-A. C-K-A, okay. Hey, Rich. Yes. How, why did she just discover it, like, last week? Yeah, I was going to ask that uh, question, uh, too. Listen, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't, <laughs> tisk, I can't do everything. <laughs> it's in your department, right? I know. Do you know this person? <laughs> I was afraid you were going to ask that. <laughs> he will uh, soon. Uh, the, 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 I actually went around to Stephanie's lab this morning to see if I could find her because uh, if I know her, I don't know that I know her. I think I probably do not know her. Right. Well, uh, I, know, I don't know. But I'm going to make so. I'm going to make sure to correct that. She ought to be coming <laughs> to Viraholics, hmm. right? Yeah. But if she comes to Viraholics, all she ever sees is the back of my head because I sit <laughs> in the front row with the bald guys. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. The age gradient in the room. Right. Um, that's a cool paper, though. Yeah. I, I remember it from handling it. Yeah. 69C, huh? Well, it's warmed up. Yeah. Right. Alan, you're next. I think she must mean 69F. 69F. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so 69Cs. <laughs> Absolutely. That'd be really hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
All right. Uh, Neil writes, Hi, Twiv team. Saw this article today and couldn't resist sending it on. You needn't read this on the show if it feels too much like the proverbial dead horse. Uh, and Neil sends um, a Bloomberg Business Week article about the same study that we just right. talked about a couple sure. of times. Uh, I like the title, though. Vaccines are safe for infants, but don't tell their parents. Yes. Right. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, uh, I think it's interesting that a number of our listeners have all picked up on this story. Yeah. So we do have an arc. We're always talking about vaccinations, yes. right? Uh, do you want to take the next one? I'll as take. Well? Yeah, that one was very short. Uh, Cheryl writes, "Hello to all. I enjoy all the twee, twiv, twim, and twip. I'm a high school social studies teacher and science enthusiast, and felt compelled to enter the fray over what constitutes outreach to those who are not members of the science ghetto. Oh boy." Sorry. <laughs> By the way, glorious imagery, though I hope the modern co connotation of ghetto, a rundown, crime ridden, and hopeless place, is not implied. <laughs> Hopefully, I do not further muddy the waters. I found it my experience that all outreach, all attempts at education, have benefit. From sharing a children's book on the wonders of the world with small children, my family and friends know that if I watch a child, a science book, or even worse, an experiment will be on the schedule. <laughs> to discussing the impact scientific knowledge had to our ancestors, to showing science shows in school, to sharing my love of science with students, to discussing the importance of science with parents during parent-teacher conferences, and convincing the religious that a science education is not blasphemous, all makes an impact. It's a run-on sentence, I know. My English colleagues are having papers. <laughs> While I bemoan as loud, if not louder, I'm not known for being reticent, the woeful state of understanding of basic scientific principles and theories evolution. This could be an entire email diatribe. You really don't want to get me started on that. I found that slogging through the bog of ignorance is possible. No single method of outreach is going to completely erase the problem, but if every scientist and every enthusiast takes every opportunity, how about grad students at malls and state fairs explaining and showing the difference between viruses and bacteria or antibiotic resistance, etc.? Nice. We can, over time, positively and significantly impact science ignorance and illiteracy. As to those who willingly stay ignorant for religious reasons, well, you don't want to get me started on that diatribe either. <laughs> Thank you all for the yeoman's work you do on these podcasts. You are making a difference. That's nice. Gee, Al, it's interesting that you should have read that one. <laughs> yes, what a coincidence that I ended up reading that one. Uh, yeah, and in fact, the, a major, perhaps the major purpose of the, um, the, the little videos that I did uh, that came along with a challenge, which was to get everybody else thinking about how they could reach out to a wider audience. Um, I think so even, the, the, you know. the point is that all of us, if we do a little bit, there's so many people out there, we, yeah. you know, you need all of us to do something because there are far fewer scientists than everybody else. And we have yeah, I really people. like this. Cheryl has a very positive, very inclusive mentality yeah. uh, and says, you know, whatever you can do, do it. That's great. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and I'm glad that she's teaching high school. Very good. Yes. Absolutely. It's great. Absolutely. Oh, Dixon. Yes. So you should read the next one because I'm it's looking at the to cookies you. already. <laughs> See, if, go ahead, Dixon, read it. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to go back because I just punched up the cookies. Oh, and now, now you're, you're messed now up. Now I'm messed up. Now I'm messed up. That's okay. Dixon might like the next one. So then I just punched up the YouTube uh, playing. And uh, it hasn't started to play. I'm afraid that I've got my volume turned up, but I'm going to hit the push button anyway and watch it go. And here it goes. And it's about to go. And the cookies are on the plate. And someone picks up the cookie. <laughs> and the Have cookies, you watched this uh, no, video, no, yeah, Dixon? I, did, I, I haven't did watched watch it. it. Now there's a bite so it's missing. So it's a machine that allows this person <laughs> to mix the ingredients for a single cookie. And um, oh, somehow the sound is still coming through. It's my sound. I'm trying oh, that's to turn your it sound. Off. How do you okay. turn it off? Uh, there's a there's a button on YouTube to the right of the pause button. There's a little um, microphone button. Oh right. I don't play and, with my iPad. And it's this it's this rotary um, <laughs> uh, thing that looks like a, a biochem lab gone wild. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Measures out the ingredients. Right, Why right, would right. he single you out to look at that thing? I have no idea. <laughs> I, guess, I, I guess I'm the uh, flattest cookie in the drawer or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, uh, can you take Mauricio's, please? Sure. Mauricio writes, 
Dear all, I'm catching up with past TWIV episodes and decided to stop in the middle of 271 and write this email. <laughs> I read the MBio paper on the jump of a plant virus to a honeybee, and given that my PhD work focused on another plant virus, I was not surprised that this could happen. I have to admit that because of my background, I was inclined to believe the collection of facts reported in this paper, and it was uh, and not an, uh, it was probably not it wasn't until i listened to your podcast that i realized that they had no negative controls i think the whole story might fall apart once the negative controls are done i guess that i assumed that although not mentioned they carried out negative controls so i accepted the validity of their experiments however after your discussion it seems like indeed they did not have negative controls i have lately been doing RTQ-PCR, and the first set of experiments I did was to do RTQ-CPR to my blanks, cells, blanks, cell, and supernatants that did not contain my sample, and I was surprised by the amount of signal I was getting from the negative control cell samples. It took me a lot of work to optimize a more stringent PCR protocol to be able to separate the background signal from the real one, and I have to say that I'm a little insulted by this paper. <laughs> Doing negative controls is crucial to validate Absolutely. your point. So I think that someone at an editor on the editor board of MBio, <clears throat> Vincent, uh, is <laughs> to take a look at the comments from the reviewers because I can't believe no one asked about the negative controls. <laughs> Perhaps that's the reason why this article was not published in Science, Nature, or PNAS. It is well known that notaviruses like FHV and uh, is that. No V. Notavirus, I guess. Notavirus. Can replicate in plant, insect, and animal cells. However, I don't think they actually cause a disease in all three of them. So how can be sure that TRV is actually replicating and causing a disease? One last thing. Purifying plant viruses from plants is extremely simple compared to mammalian viruses. So I was surprised they did not look for TRV in plants. Anyway, the bottom line is that when I read this paper, I assumed that they did a lot of controls which were not mentioned. And that has made me think that I need to reevaluate how I read scientific articles. My goodness. I didn't, Very good. I didn't handle that paper. Right. Um, we we could we could blame it on you anyway. That's yeah, so I never yeah. saw it till it was published. Actually, Vincent, that's called denial. You know that. <laughs> uh, I, I looked at who the editor was, and I, I I'm you yeah. know I don't know who it yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. not familiar with the person, but but to the point about reading scientific articles, yes, anything that should be in there should be mentioned. Yeah, and if sure. it's well, if it's not mentioned, you should assume that it wasn't done. The most interesting head game for me that's about true. doing science is. Being is being objective. It really takes a conscious effort to be objective. Here. If you see something that you like and it attracts your attention, it's very easy to uh, ignore things that yeah. go yeah. against it or to Absolutely. ignore the fact that certain controls sure. aren't being done. And the real discipline is maintaining objectivity and making sure that the controls are all there and that you're not being sucked in. It's a good lesson for anybody, you know. You bet. Yeah. Uh, you know, scientist or not, very <laughs> critical thinking, yeah. Well, you know, critical you part of scientific education is <laughs> is learning not to trust your your gut response to something. Yeah. Well, right. also it ha you have to read the paper you can't just read the abstract and the introduction and the discussion if you right. don't read the experiments right. you're, you're not going to know if they did it properly right. and abstracts are them, for figuring out if the paper is relevant people to what you're do, many studying. people do not read the entire paper as we yep. do now for example my colleague on one of my other podcasts said oh you know I really like that bee plant virus paper and I'm going to have someone write a blog post about it hmm. and I said let them listen to TWIV on that because <laughs> I'm sure they're not going to read the methods and they won't know this. So it's very easy to do, especially, you know, you say, oh, this is cool. You summarize it and you forget. That's right. Dixon, can you read Craig's letter, please? I certainly can. Craig writes, Dear TWIV team, in your TWIV 274, you read an email regarding my recent paper demonstrating commonly used disinfectants do not kill HPV. You discussed how someone may potentially be infected from a fomite. Well, we feel that the common person probably does not have anything to worry about. However, there are certain situations where there is concern. 
Many OBGYN labs use reusable devices for examinations. These devices cannot be autoclaved and are treated usually with a glutaraldehyde-based disinfectant. Our study showed that even after 48 hours exposure, much longer than recommended for OBGYN equipment, did not inactivate the virus. Additionally, about 20% of individuals with uh, anogenital HPV, -C, HPV uh, infections at any one time have HPV on their fingertips, and the active ingredient in the sanitizer does nothing to the virus. While the study does not in any way suggest a ubiquitous uh, risk of fomite-transmitted HPV infection, it does suggest that possibly under certain circumstances that it could be possible. Mm. Your show is great. Keep up the great work, Craig. Hey, he's the author of one of the authors of that book. Yes. <laughs> cool. Yes. <laughs> right. yes. And I'm I'm really glad to have that clarification. Yeah. He uh, hmm. he points out uh, that particular circumstance with the uh, oh. OBGYN office that's um, a little creepy, actually. Yeah, yeah. I'd say. I mean, glutaraldehyde <laughs> yep. is a fixative for electromicroscopy, for gosh sakes. But I guess they don't use it in a high enough concentration, perhaps. Well, or I, for long enough or something. Is, this is good because this wasn't clear from the paper. Right, so. it wasn't clear from the paper, and that's nice to have that clarified. That's good. <laughs> Great. All right, the next one is from Joseph, who writes, Vincent et al. Many podcasts ago, you were gracious enough to read my poorly structured question about <laughs> why life would form in such glorious complexity, given the drive for disorder in the universe described in the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> At the time, you all were unable to shed much light on my conundrum. However, you did ultimately provide a great answer through one of your weekly picks on TWIV, the magazine Quanta, which you recommended. As a dutiful listener, I went to the site to check it out and was amazed that the first article I found addressed exactly the issue in question. A great article that provides a real insight into why life is so <laughs> prolific. Life does not violate the second law of thermodynamics, but until recently, physicists were unable to use thermodynamics to explain why it should arise in the first place. This is a quote from the article. From the standpoint of physics, there is one essential difference between living things and inanimate clumps of carbon atoms. The former tend to be much better at capturing energy from their environment and dissipating <coughs> that energy as heat. Jeremy England, a 31-year-old professor at MIT, has derived a mathematical formula that he believes explains this capacity. The formula based on established physics indicates that when a group of atoms is driven by an external source of energy like the sun or chemical fuel and surrounded by a heat bath like the ocean or atmosphere, it will often gradually restructure itself in order to dissipate increasingly more energy. This could mean that under certain conditions, matter inexorably re acquires the key physical attribute associated with life. That's interesting. I like that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, this quanta is actually... A very interesting. Dixon, what are you doing? I'm coughing. I have a, I'm, I'm, I have a human characteristic of coughing every night. Great science. Now we're back to uh, yes. Joe. Great science is when someone can state the question in a way that leads in a solvable direction. I should have been asking, under what conditions is life thermodynamically favored over non-living systems? Hmm. The answer then becomes when there is a good source of energy as food and good waste heat dump. This allows the high efficiency of organized living process to outcompete other systems. Seems like a nice way to describe the driving force behind evolution. As always, love the shows. Goodbye and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> What's that from? That's, That's from the Hitchhiker's, Hitchhiker's Guide, Guide to, to the, the Galaxy. 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 Hmm. That's the uh, dolphins uh, saying so long to the humans. So long and thanks for all the fish. That's yes. right. Uh, has something to do with 42, right? Yeah. Mm hmm Okay. So Joe, is it forty is it forty two? Yes. Forty two is the answer. Yes. Okay. That's right. But what was the question? That's the point. Uh, this is great, Joe. You've learned something on your own using resources. You had a question, it wasn't you couldn't figure it out, you found a resource that did it. You're on your yeah. way to being a scientist. Yeah. Great. All right, we're back to Kathy. Lance writes, Hi, Twiv team. I really enjoyed Vincent and Rich's episode this week with Eugene Coonan. I did find Eugene Coonan a little difficult to understand, and I had to keep skipping back, but it was still an excellent episode. I have a question. You mentioned there are an estimated one million gene families. Does this refer only to viral gene families, or is it the number of gene families in all organisms? Hmm. There's an, I asked Eugene if you want to read his answer down there, Kathy. Ah, oh, Okay. So, uh, his answer, I think what I meant was there, actually that there might be about a million gene families in prokaryotes, a ballpark estimate for sure. The number of virus families is expected to be at least several times greater. I think I mentioned that too. Okay. 
Okay. So then uh, Lance offers a listener pick of the week. Miles Powers is YouTube channel. And here's the link, and he gives the link to the channel, uh, which I haven't had a chance to look at. Recently, Miles, not his real name, I don't think, has made a series of videos debunking the 2009 HIV-AIDS denialist film House of Numbers. In return for his efforts, he has had several notices under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA, <laughs> claiming he is infringing copyright by showing segments of House of Numbers for the purpose of criticism. <laughs> In other words, the HIV denialist argument is so poor, they have resorted to trying to silence a vocal critic by getting his YouTube channel shut down. Fortunately, they failed. Those, d those responsible for the DMCA notices are journalist Liam Sheff and businessman Martin Penny, who runs a business that supplies the British National Health Service, worryingly. Hmm. I know your policy has been not to discuss this issue on TWIV because the science is so resoundingly settled, and I agree with that. But I did not realize quite how harmful the de HIV denial movement was until I came across this article recently from JAIDS, Journal of AIDS, in 2008, which estimates that 330,000 people died because of delayed antiretroviral rollout due to the HIV denialist movement in South Africa. Mm. That said, this movement is not susceptible to reason. Look at the recent email from your listener, Martin. I believe I am right in saying he has been listening for a long time, owns a copy of your book, and emails regularly over this issue. Clearly, his view has not changed from several years of exposure to good, broad science and exceedingly well explained, if I may say so, on TWIV. But Miles has been given a hard time, and some support from quiz TWIV listeners I am sure would be appreciated, although I am a little late on the uptake with this. The story has been followed by Ben Goldacre and Abby Smith, uh, ERV, among others. He also has lots of great videos on science. Uh, okay, all of this is publicly available on the internet, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. mostly on Miles' YouTube channel, Facebook page, and blog. The weather in Bangalore is unseasonably and pleasantly cool at 27 Celsius. <laughs> we have even had a bit of a little bit of rain recently. I wasn't aware of, of uh, Miles, but we'll put these links in so people can go and those are good. Give some yeah. support. Yeah. Yeah. 27 Celsius is not cool. No. no. <laughs> well, for well, Bangalore. I was going to say, is, I, I've though, been to Bangalore. That's, that's habitable. <laughs> I don't, um, you know, do these AIDS denialist types, do they actually believe it? I don't sure. Know. Okay. Or are they just screwing around? I just don't know. Just to get attention. Some well, of I them, I mean, in, in the case, this, this paper that he links to is... Um, uh, about South Africa's uh, disaster with this, where people high in the government um, right. decided to buy into it. And I think, you know, it's like any of these uh, counter-rational types of belief systems. The people who buy into it are getting something out of that belief. It comforts right. them in some way or it gives right. them, you know, a feeling of belonging in a community. And I think in South Africa's case, it was... Um, it was politically a way to bury their heads in the sand, <clears throat> to say, no, 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 we don't have a problem. It's uh, HIV is not what's causing this. It's got to be something else. And uh, as a result, you know, as this article tallies up, it's like 3.8 million person years were lost from the hundreds of thousands of lives that were ended from not treating for this virus. So, yeah, I think some, some people do actually buy into this. Sure. Wow. Alan, okay. you're, Alan, you're next. Okay. Uh, Maria writes, I enjoyed this episode on TWIV. Uh, I'm not sure which one that was. I'll find the one out. before that, I think. Um, it was a really fascinating discussion, and I hope you'll expand on the evolutionary implications of viruses. Maybe Eugene Coonan? Yeah, Sounds I like. A, I have a feeling it is. That was an excellent episode, by the way. Um, I understand it's time to replace the introductory phrase on TWIV. <laughs> what about the kind that shape you and still are shaping your life? I yes, really appreciate your contagious passion in virology. <laughs> Best regards Ooh. from a virocentric listener, there Maria. There you go, virocentricity. Yes, yes virocentricity. Yes, it was uh, Eugene Coonan. I, <laughs> yeah. I looked it up. Yeah, I mean, I understand it's not all about the kind that make you sick. But right. for the new listeners, let me just explain. When I first made that first episode in September of 2008... It was a Saturday, I was editing it, and I said, you know, I don't want computer people to think this is about computer viruses, because right. I came up with that. Right. I know it's not right, but I, I kind of like it. It, <laughs> it. it has, I went through a phase of, no, nah, that's just, that's not really exactly what we talk about, but no, then of course not. I, came, I came around on it, and it, it, 
it sticks. It does. <laughs> it has a ring. It does. Indeed. It's here for good. Yeah. Rich, you're next. Ying writes, dear Twiv hosts, in the episode Twiv 275, Dr. Kunin mentioned that viruses are the most abundant biological entities on the planet Earth. As I was reading the end of an hour, as I was reaching the end of an hour long jogging, instantly I wondered if there's any life form that can feed on these tiny particles. <laughs> After all, a virus is a little ball of tasty proteins and nucleotides. <laughs> Some of the enveloped ones even bring along fat. Let me know what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Micro filter feeders. Uh, well, you'd have to take in quite a number of particles now. And in the ocean, you know, there are about a million particles per milliliter. Well, that's right. So, you know, filter filtering whales are going to bring that in, right? But I don't know if anyone knows if they provide any nutrition of any sort. That's an interesting question. A really interesting question. I it have is. never heard that I, one before. No, that's a new one. Huh? What do you think, hmm. Kathy? I don't know if you could do some kind of experiment, you know, <laughs> like at a Sea World or something, you know, with a pool that did or did not have viruses in it. Yeah, we're Measure. certainly talking about the very bottom of the food chain. <laughs> yeah, and then, about the then end. Just, that is the you know, end. <laughs> think what kind of a weight gain you'd be looking for, you know, in a whale or a porpoise or something. Right. I mean, be how many? Really... How many picograms did the whale gain? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Dixon, this next one has a link, so I don't want you to do it so you no, don't get lost. I'm not going to do it. Anyway, it's from Cindy. That's who right. Who writes, I wish I could craft like this, but it's not one of my talents. And she sends right. a link to a periodic table quilt. I thought you would like that, Kathy, right? Yeah, I haven't cool? had a chance to look at it Take yet. Take a look. Okay, it's I will. It's okay. really something. Gorgeous. Ha. Uh, huh. It's actually a behind the scenes of how it was done. and Nice. It's just beautiful. Nice. So I, love, I love quilts, too. Cindy is a, is a professor in... Uh, Oh, yeah. Henderson State, which is in Arkadelphia, which I didn't know existed. <laughs> is that a combination of Arkansas and Philadelphia? It's right next to Texarkana. <laughs> cool. So, Dixon, now you can read. I can take the next one. Dregs, right. Greg writes. The recent special episode on MERS, coronavirus, and camels was excellent. Just like all ep other episodes of TWIV, keep up the good work. I want to respond to a point that Dr. Lipkin made regarding King Saud University's intellectual property rights in Mayer's coronavirus. I, with, I agree with Dr. Lipkin that it is important that the university makes its virus isolates freely available to researchers for study, but I cannot agree with his statement that it does not, quotes, it does not make any sense to try to maintain it as intellectual property because it doesn't have much value in that respect, in quotes. Elsewhere in the podcast, Dr. Lipkin expressed his hopes that someone will develop a camel vaccine against his, this virus to prevent the sorts of outbreaks in camels that lead to human infections. It takes a lot of upfront capital investment to develop a vaccine and obtain regulatory clearance to mass manufacture it and bring it to market. Without intellectual property protections, no entity with the infrastructure to bring a virus to market will find it worthwhile to make the necessary investments. There is a balance to be struck between freedom of scientists to study these isolates and King Saud University's PI rights. But Dr. Lipkin goes too far when he says that these IP rights, quotes, don't have much value. Best regards, Greg. Um, I think it depends. There, there. It, it depends on what you're patenting. If you're trying to patent the wild type virus, that doesn't seem like it would have much value. Mm -hmm. If you're patenting a method for making a vaccine, that could have an enormous amount of value. Right. You bet. That's exactly it. You, you wouldn't patent the wild virus to but, make the but vaccine. But Vince, right? you, you have another answer to this. You had a guest in your office day before yesterday, as I recall, <laughs> the son of the inventor of the yes. polio vaccine, who said once... Yeah, someone asked him if he patented the vaccine, and he said, there's no patent. Could you patent the son? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. We have we do have patent lawyers listening, so <laughs> they would probably say the answer is yes. Talk, Depends on the sun. Yes. Red giants, no, but white dwarfs, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think the process of vac making the vaccine, sure, it's, that's what Ian meant. The, the, that virus itself, you know, it's, you're right, it's not patentable, right? Right. It's a natural. It's a naturally occurring virus. Now yeah. you could you could also come up with a patent for a method to detect it. Yeah. 
Sure. And you could patent if the vaccine was an attenuated strain, you could patent right. the attenuated strain because you produced that. Right. But there has to be, you've got to do something to get a patent. You can't just point at a rock and say, I'm patenting that rock. You, right. So you can't just take a virus that naturally occurs in camels and say, I'm patenting this virus. It's got to be something that you're doing yep. with it. <coughs> what did Frank Zappa say? It must be the camel. Must be the camel. Must be the camel. Must be the camel. Uh, next one's from Claire, who writes, hi, Vincent and pals. You guys my pal? Sure. Sure. Right. sure. Good. You Thank betcha. you. First, thanks for all your work. I'm always impressed with your dedication and the effort you put into Twiv Twim Twip. I recently moved from a tech position in a freshwater and marine ecology lab to another tech job in a human immunology lab. The contract basis of the work in the previous job made it so there was not much time or encouragement to read literature, and the lab didn't have a journal club. <laughs> we mostly did microscopy. I bet I've seen more chironomids than Dixon. <laughs> What's a chironomid? It's a midge. It lives in freshwater. As a larva, you'd call them little little noceums, but actually they're bigger than noceums. They're aquatic insects. Okay. I've done some reading related to the projects I'm working on in the new lab, but it is sometimes difficult to get through papers where it seems like every other word is unfamiliar, even if the topic is interesting. Although I have to admit, there are times when I don't even understand it enough to know if I am interested. Mm-hmm. Does the TWIV team have any how-to-read-a-paper tips? Oh. Where do you begin when you are just getting started with a topic? Should I stick with reviews? Turn back to my textbooks from college for more brushing up on acronyms? Oh, great questions. Also, any ideas for how my microscopy, insect, other invert ID skills might transfer to my new position or a future career? Wow. Thanks, Claire in Seattle, where regardless of time or season, it is probably 10 degrees C <laughs> and overcast. <laughs> Boy, do we have tips. Oh, we have 30 see. minutes of tips isolated as a recording <laughs> there in the archives, don't yeah. we? That's true. We do. Mm -hmm. We had a show where we talked yeah. about how to read a paper. I'll find the link. We'll right. put that in. Right. I think and I and actually, read reviews that. are a good place to start when you're sure. on a new topic. So the crossover skills between entomology and infectious diseases uh, turns out to be all the ag departments of every state. They're absolutely riveted to the spot in terms of trying to identify pathogens transmitted to plants through insects that uh, carry them. And uh, there's a lot of examples of that. And, or the, an insect that makes a bite in a plant and then the offending microbe then gets in afterwards. Mm -hmm. So there's tons of jobs out there for people with those double skills. Keep it up. Yeah. Was it, what episode was this, Vincent? It was part of uh, 169, Epidemiology Causes Conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it always brings a chuckle. <laughs> in in an S-shaped curve. <laughs> Yeah, we'll put the link to that for you there. Uh, I would, I, you know, what one of the things that comes to mind is that the most important thing is just keep at it. It takes practice. Yeah, it's really hard. And you Go know, to journal clubs. You, you, yeah, journal clubs are a good idea. Keep at it, and you know, Wikipedia. Yeah, I sit that's there, true. I, yeah, you're even right. You're now, right. I read stuff outside of my discipline, and I'm sitting there with sure. Wikipedia going the whole time. Sure, sure. Kathy, can you take the next one? Mark writes. Dear TWIV team, I thought you might like to see this cross-stitch artwork of a variety of pathogens <laughs> to add to the growing number of pics on the art of microbes. And he sends a link to an Etsy site. I didn't see a polio virus for Vincent, but you could order one from the artist. <laughs> I'm not sure of the accuracy of some of them. The bird flu one looks strange to me. <laughs> While writing this, I found this site, too. And uh, he sends a link to the giant microbes, uh, which many of us have examples of in our offices uh, <laughs> they're they're the little plushy uh, things, right? But uh, I hadn't seen this particular uh, Etsy site before either, so that's yeah, nice. Very cool, really nice cross stitching. Well, you said it's not only cross stitching, but something else too. Uh, it, different kinds of needlepoint, needlework. Yeah. It's very um, cute. Yeah, cruel is the word I was thinking of. Cruel. C r e w e l. Yep. Love it. Yeah. Ellen, you are next. Okay. Um, Agna. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're up to? Okay. Agna writes, good afternoon. I'm a bio biology student in Germany, and we just finished a molecular genetics course with the introduction to virology. Mm -hmm. As I find virology very interesting, I'm also currently following your virology 2014 course on YouTube. However, I have a question that so far I cannot find an answer to. 
I read in one of the textbooks that when a particular phage enters bacteria, and when a particular phage enters bacteria and integrates into its genome in the lysogenic cycle, no other phages are able to infect that bacterium. My question is why? Do they modify receptors of the bacteria? I know that in humans, uh, in the human case, this does not happen. Influenza virus, uh, for example, and antigenic shift. So why does it happen in bacteria? Thanks for your time. Good question. Very good question. You know the answer, Rich? Well, I would say, first of all, that it's not that no other bacteriophage can infect the bacterium. It's uh, other related bacteriophage can't uh, uh, infect the bacterium. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's because the lysogenic guy makes a repressor that uh, shuts down gene expression on itself to keep it in its repressed state as a prophage. And any related infecting virus that comes in that will be sensitive to the action of that repressor is repressed before it has a chance to get off the ground. Did I get it right? Sounds beautiful. Huh. I think so. Yeah, you're the phage guy after all. Yeah, but it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, Rich, you're next. That's me. Uh, Ricardo writes, hello, Twivome. I like this. Have you seen this? Uh, let me see. And Oh, I just had a, a quick look at this. Um, and... Mm. Uh, did anybody else look at this? It's uh, yeah. virus decoys, nanoscale virus traps that capture and destroy viruses. Good lord! The nanoparticles, basically, huh. that's, right. that suck up I mean, like viruses, Pac-Man? like Pac-Man. Yeah, I don't know why they go into the nanoparticle though. There is no explanation of that charge. You think so? It's Try not be charge. Might it might be yeah. <laughs> Mm. Nanoparticles so far suck up 97% of the viruses outside of cells wow. before they infect cells. Hmm. Viral Very vacuum. Viral mm. vacuum. All right. I didn't All see right. that. Thank you. Uh, you want to take the next one, uh, Rich? Sure. Uh, it's got a, this has got a video and the whole thing. Yeah. All Great right. idea. Um, dear Vincent and Twiv colleagues, I enjoy the podcast when I get a chance to listen. They were both informative and entertaining. Nevertheless, I do want to comment on a non-virological statement made in a podcast last month. Mm. In, do we ever make statements that are non-virological? <laughs> in, we try not to. In episode but. 266, you commented at about 25, 26 minutes that testing for breast and ovarian cancer-related genes, BRCA1 and 2, uh, by 23andMe, was a positive aspect actionable of their direct to consumer business i am not a supporter of 23andme their business model their testing methods and their largely irresponsible approach to providing information of potential medical relevance specifically with respect to testing for breaker one and two some months ago i came across uh, a summary see link below of a consumer genetics conference in which ellen matloff director of the cancer genetics counseling center at yale Cancer Center expressed her view that 23andMe reports on break it testing, 23andMe reports on breaking testing were quote break it testing were quote criminal. The relevant paragraph is quoted verbatim below, and here's the quote: In a session on the pros and cons of consumer testing, Ellen Matloff, director of the Genetic Counseling Center at Yale Cancer Center, uh, presented a GAO report from 2006 highlighting issues with direct-to-consumer tests. Matloff called some practices criminal, specifically the 23andMe recommendations included in the report for patients with positive breakup findings, and questioned the practice of ever providing genetics results without counseling. I wrote to Ellen to learn a little Uh, a bit more about the sources of her dissatisfaction. In her email reply to me, she noted that the 23andMe breaker related analyses and reports had multiple problems, including one, using panels of SNPs for which there is no consensus, presumably with respect to interpretive uh, significance, two, advertising, two, and testing, four, children uh, 
with respect to adult onset diseases, which is contrary to the consensus in the field. Three, providing 23andMe customers testing positive for cancer-associated break alleles with the American Cancer Society guidelines addressing breast surveillance for the average American woman. And four, in a couple of cases from the Yale Cancer Genetics Counseling Center, patients testing positive, according to 23andMe, for cancer-related break alleles received reports assigning them average or low risk for breast or ovarian cancer. Below are two additional links that addresses some of the complexities associated with BRCA testing. Although 23andMe may be temporarily prevented from disseminating test information that could be interpreted as medically relevant, these articles provide more reasons why such direct-to-consumer testing is potentially problematic for disease-associated allele, allele loci such as BRCA1 and 2 in the absence of expert genetic counseling services, at least for some consumers. Mm. Interesting. Well, very good. Very yeah. interesting. I, very I good. Stand very corrected yeah. in supporting 23andMe. This is, these are all great points. Yep. T- and, title that email, BRCA bad. BRCA mm. bad. Very Oof. good, Alan. Wow. Uh, and this... Uh, uh, the author is a professor of pathology and director of histocompatibility and immunogenetics at University Hospitals Case Medical Center at Case Western Reserve. So he knows what he's talking about. Uh, he knows what he's talking about. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Neil. Yep. My son is going to have his exome sequenced, and he had to go for genetic counseling right. to do that because they tell him you can, might find this out and that out. You know, sure. you just don't go and have it sequenced. That's right. So I think it's a good point for the vast majority of the population, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and I didn't know this about uh, that they were they were looking at non-standardized SNPs. Yeah, I didn't know that either. So you don't even know what the results mean. Hmm. All right, Dixon, uh, you need to go, right? I'm afraid I do. Okay. I have enjoyed this day immensely, as usual. And I will send you my pick of the week. It's actually a spiral representation of the periodic table, and then they're colorized according to groups. You'll love it. Okay. You'll absolutely cool. love it. It's fantastic. Thank it would make Dixon. a great quilt, Kathy. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dixon, for joining us. <laughs> Pleasure. Bye, and Dixon. Goodbye, Bye, Dixon. Bye. Bye, Alan. Goodbye, Kathy. Bye. All right. Let's, uh, let's see. We're at me. I guess we'll take one more here and yeah. wrap it up. This next one is from, I don't know how to pronounce this, Ine. Ine. I- Ina. 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 A-I-N-E. A-I-N-E. Dear Twiv team. Thank you all so very much for such wonderful podcasts. You have no idea how happy you have made me since I discovered TWIV. I'm a research scientist in Queen Mary Medical School, London, and I've researched HIV for many years. I've always been embarrassed about how little I know of other viruses. Your podcasts are fantastic. I mostly listen to them when I'm out jogging. They're very inspirational and keep up to date. They've even helped inspire me to start a new research direction. Because running is the only real time I have to totally, totally to myself. It's a perfect time to listen to you. Lots and lots of fun. Even more keeps me motivated while running. Main reason I'm getting in touch is that now next week, 26 March, I'll be giving a seminar on viruses in my local school, the Archery Academy, to children 11 to 12 years old. They have regular seminars after school called Bright Ideas. Do you have any idea of anything particularly exciting I could present to them? I'm going to talk about HIV, swine flu, SARS, chickenpox, smallpox, viruses that cause common colds, transmission, and viruses. So I sent him or her a bunch of ideas, um, all based on TWIV stories, basically. <laughs> you just go through the last 20 episodes of sure. TWIV. Sure. You find a ton of them. Uh, I'll also announce a competition for the best Minecraft virus produced by the children. <laughs> End date, 26th April. I don't really know what the uptake will be, but I think there is unlikely to be more than 20 entries. I will be directing them to TWIV 101 for some ideas. Would the TWIV team be willing to judge this competition? If this is too much, no worries. I can find another solution. Keep up the fantastic work. So I said, yeah, we'd be happy to. Sure, why not? Sure. My son is a huge Minecraft addict, so I know the game well. (laughs) And it would be fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll, see, mm-hmm. we'll put the we'll put them on Twiv. That would be great. All right. Thanks, everybody, for all your email. There are a bunch more here. We'll get to another Eventually. time. Eventually. <laughs> we did okay. Not bad, actually. My yeah. scroll bar is, uh, I think, three-quarters of the way down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's well. do some picks. Alan, what do you have for us? Okay. I have, I've linked to this 
particular webcomic several times before, but this this uh, episode of it is especially good and explanatory. Uh, you've probably heard about the Heartbleed bug. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have. It's a huge, huge uh, security lapse that was in a very widely used key on the internet or, or encryption system on the internet. Um, and this little webcomic explains how it works. Hmm. Explains what the issue is. Um, and and does it just with somebody sending requests to a server and depending on how they format that request, they get particular answers. And if they deliberately format it wrong, they get an answer that reveals additional information about other stuff that's on the server. Oh. And that is the essence of the problem. Mm-hmm. That right. this this bug allows uh, allowed it's pretty much everybody has rushed to patch it, but uh, in the meantime, any site that was using this particular type of uh, of security setup um, was vulnerable to this type of of a hack. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. It's a good. There's a good site that has a list of all the sites that you should change your password on, and hmm. not. It's easily to find it. Uh, Kathy, what do you have for us? Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, I picked uh, Quizlet, which is a flashcard app. Nice. You can uh, look at it online, and uh, it's a free download from iTunes. Uh, and uh, it's just, you can make your own flashcards for something, or you can look at flashcards that other people have made. You can share flashcards. They can have structures. So I looked, I have a set of three by five cards that have I've had forever that are my amino acid structure flashcards. Um, so I didn't really need amino acid flashcards, but uh, they can do that. I did a couple of virology uh, topics. You can use them for languages. Um, and I think it's all the rage now to do flashcards on your smartphone. So uh, this looked like a pretty good app. Cool. That's great. That's a nice resource. Neat. Absolutely. Very nice. I didn't know they existed. I bet your kids do. Yes, especially the one who plays Minecraft. Mm-hmm. Or maybe not. Rich, what do you have? I have a New York Times opinion page that I ran across that is relevant to one of our arcs <laughs> uh, titled Why Nothing is Truly Alive. Yeah, right. And it's titled by, <laughs> it's, it's uh, written by Ferris, how do you pronounce his last name? Jabber, Jabbar, Jabber. J-A-B-R, who is a freelance writer and an associate editor for Scientific American. And uh, to make a long story short, he says none of the definitions for life really work. You can always find exceptions where non-living things look like living things by a given definition or living things look like non-living things by definition. And says the real problem is that the whole, uh, the word life is really just a concept um, and that uh, doesn't really exist. There's, uh, in his mind, I guess, no distinction between living and non-living, if you like. It's just our conception uh, of the universe. And as, uh, as entertaining as anything else, is, uh, he, as a theme in this, he's got, um, uh, who is this guy? Theo Jansen, a Dutch artist who makes these kinetic things that he calls strand beasts that are these wild, very animated looking things that uh, are made out of pipes and stuff that when the wind blows on them, they can actually walk. And there's a a beautiful uh, video of this thing and he points out that this guy thinks of his sculptures as uh, living and it's just one of his examples. At any rate, I thought this was a at least an amusing uh, twist on our "What is Life" arc. Yeah, I don't agree with him. <laughs> I think that there is a clear definition of life. It's useful to do. He says, you know, it's it's not defi- like I said, defining life is futile and unnecessary. But I don't agree with that. I think it really helps to sort out what you think is living or not. And I think it's good that there's a debate. Um, Actually, I really like the definition that we wound up with today. The, in that previous email, mm-hmm. uh, that it's uh, things that 
I, I can't even do it, but uh, 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 respond to, uh, are good at organizing themselves mm -hmm. and respond to an input of energy yeah. uh, by generating heat. At any rate. Yep. All right. My pick is a podcast called the Ag Sci Podcast, Ag Sci Today. It's by a couple of, uh, well, at least one, yeah, both of them are TWIV, TWIM listeners. Uh, one of them is actually a dairy farmer in Minnesota, Tim, who often writes to us. And Steph is a graduate student in virology at Ohio State. And um, they talk about farming. And they, um, in their first episode, they, they thank us for the inspiration. They talk about farm-related science. They do some papers, but they also talk about cows and goats and in a scientific way it's really different cool. and they are pretty good so the guy's a farmer she's a graduate student they do it via Skype they do a good job I really like it so Great. we inspired I, another one I like their tagline too cultivating knowledge yes or cultivating knowledge <laughs> yes cultivating knowledge that's yeah, right that's good agricultural research so check that out Get give them the uh, the twiff bump well we had a couple of listener picks I think, but let me just add a couple. One from Raihan. This is too awesome. Cheap do-it-yourself microscope made from paper primarily, which users can assemble themselves. It can be used for diagnostics, especially to be sent to places where it'll be difficult to send large, bulky, bulky microscopes to. Judging from the diseases listed, I would guess that this should be more applicable for TWIP than TWIV, but like what you always remind Professor de Pommier, we don't do pics on TWIP. <laughs> <laughs> Enough of me talking. I'll let the video speak for itself. Love the show. Greetings from Singapore. So Actually, he stole my pic. Really? <laughs> this thing is really cool. Is this the 50-cent microscope? Yes. Yeah. It's very cool. This is very cool. hot. A lot of people are, are doing this. Uh, Gerald writes, Hi Twiv, I'm compelled to send thanks to you all and to offer up a website chock full of information. I am a Virology 2 Coursera student. I have enjoyed the course immensely. I recently discovered a link from Twiv that is something I have been looking for for a long time. I never would have found it unless I became connected to your course and, of course, Twiv itself. The link I recommend is davincipress.com. On this website is a free biochemistry textbook in PDF, which contains links to all course lectures. YouTube videos delivered by Professor Kevin Ahern at Oregon State University, where, of course, Linus Pauling supplanted himself as a two-time Nobel Prize winner so many years ago. Thank you all again. Keep up the great podcasts. And finally, Neil writes, so many places this could go. Viral video, for example. Heard about this while listening to my other favorite podcast. Wait, wait, don't tell me after a short bit about the 30,000-year-old virus that was revived in quotes, ha ha, enjoy. This is um, I'm a Virus, Mr. W's Virus Rap. Okay. Oh, right. It's good. <laughs> it's very good. It is very good. And um, he puts revived in quotes because I um, took Carl Zimmer in that Times article about uh, the, the Siberian virus, pithovirus. Uh, he called the, the headline was the virus is revived, and he mentioned reviving and resuscitation. So I wrote a blog post saying you can't revive a virus, and <laughs> Zimmer actually wrote a blog post in return saying yes, I can. <laughs> so we had a nice little discussion. I'm actually glad that Carl deigned to reply, which is really nice. I think these kinds of discussions are useful. So that's that. That's our listener picks and iTunes Twiv TV. Of course, is where you'll find Twiv. Do send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. And Dixon de Pommier, of course, who has left us, can be found at verticalfarm.com. Kathy Spindler is in Ann Arbor, Michigan, at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. It's nice to hear all these different things that the listeners are thinking about. Wonderful. I love emails. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure. This is great fun. Good we, fun. We uh, are glad to have you back. I'm glad to be back, though I must say I was having a good time while I wasn't here. I went on a sailing regatta last week that was the best sailing I've ever had. It was amazing. Well, that's so, great. It's good. We but it is good to be here. We just miss you. You can do whatever you want, obviously. Uh, 
<laughs> Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com, also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>